Ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the Presidential Task Force, gentlemen of the press, today is Thursday, the 15th of October, 2020, and I welcome you to the national briefing by the Presidential Task Force. During the last briefing on Monday, the 12th October 2020, I informed you that the Presidential Task Force had compiled all its observations and findings and would in due course present the Earth Interim Report and recommendations to Mr. President to enable the national response proceed into the next phase. The Earth Interim Report focused on the primary objective of consolidating the gains recorded in the national response over a period of six weeks, which ended on the 13th October 2020. Nigerians will recall that the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 announced the current measures as approved by Mr. President on 3rd September 2020 for a period of four weeks. But due to other exigencies, including the celebration of the diamond anniversary of Nigeria's independence, the phase had to be extended. For the purposes of emphasis and reminder, the Presidential Task Force continues to build on progress made, navigate challenges encountered, and remain on course to achieve the following. Slowing transmission, preserving lives and livelihood, and addressing disruptions caused by the pandemic in all sectors of the economy and our lives. Let me at this point avail a snippet of the global situation. As you are all aware, all around the globe, millions continue to be affected by the devastating effects of COVID-19. Many countries in different continents have, however, gradually commenced reopening and adapting to the reality of the pandemic, lasting longer than originally expected. Schools are reopening with strict guidelines Airlines have commenced flights with enforced advisories, and other aspects of social engagement continue to be gradually reincorporated. The response remains buoyed by ever increasing global collaboration between and among nations and with international organizations in country public and private sectors have also teamed up to expand the scope of their partnership, especially in resource mobilization, risk communication, and the race to find a cure. I am pleased to add that the PTF has observed and learned great lessons from these jurisdictions and has similarly taken measures to reopen our economy, Albert, in a safe and cautious manner. Much as the world is coming to terms with the new normal, emerging statistics indicate that we, are still, we still have to be cautious, vigilant by taking responsibilities. As of the 14th of October 2020, the summary of the global situation for COVID-19 stood as follows. One, cumulative case count had exceeded 38 million. The United States, India, Brazil, and Russia were recording over a million cases. Three, on the African continent, South Africa continues to record the highest case count with Morocco, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Nigeria following in that order. Four, 
the reopening of air spaces and other areas of society continue to increase the risk of subsequent outbreaks. Five countries in Europe have been experiencing a high level of second wave of infections after reopening their economies. And six, some countries are reintroducing stricter measures to control the spread and are confronted by the difficult choices of introducing short national lockdowns or limiting local restrictions. By way of comparison, over a period of one month between 13th September and 13th October 2020, the following statistics will show you the changes around the wall as depicted in the tables on the screen. If you can see on the screen, I can see that they have, all, they have already jumped to the, to the chart. But cumulatively, globally, cases from the 13th of September, we had a record case of 28 million plus. 13th of October 2020, that number got to 37 million plus. You can see that in terms of percentages, there was increase of 9 million plus, which represent 32%. On the African region, on the 13th of September, the recorded cases were 1.1 million plus. By the 13th of October 2020, the figure had gotten to 1.237 million plus, an increase of over 120,000 plus, representing 11% increase. Back at home in Nigeria, our figure on the 13th of September were 56,000 plus. By 13th of October, our figure had gotten to 60,655. Clear increase within a period of one month of 4,399, representing in terms of percentages, 8%. Similarly, the same thing with debt toll globally on the 13th of October, uh, September, there were 917,000 plus fatalities. By the, 20, uh, by the 13th of, of October 2020, that figure rose to 1,081,000 plus fatalities, a clear increase of 164,415, representing 18 percent in terms of percentages. If you look at the statistics on the African continent, on the 13th of September, our fatalities were 23,000 plus. By the 13th of October, it rose to 27,000 plus. A difference of 3,624, representing 15% in terms of percentages. In Nigeria, it was 1,082 on the 13th of September. On the 13th of October, it rose to 1,116. In numbers, 34 fatalities, which represents 3%. This gives you a clear picture of where we stand globally on the African continent and in Nigeria. In Nigeria, the Presidential Task Force continues to rely on data, research, science, and experience of other nations to inform decisions at all stages. Our national response to COVID-19 remains targeted at achieving the purposes of epidemic control through reduced transmission and minimizing mortality among the vulnerable parts of our population. Till date, 
Nigeria has sustained the substantial successes earlier recorded, although statistics show that this pandemic is now slowing down globally. The number of recorded cases in Nigeria have remained between 100 and 200 daily for the last four weeks, with a progressive fall in the case fatality rate to 1.9%. The reduction in the test positivity ratio to less than 5% further collaborates the belief that the pandemic curve is flattening. Despite the unsatisfactory testing rate in the country attributable to general apathy among the populace. The graph on the screen illustrates the case fatality ratio. As at October 14, 2020, the vital information generated in Nigeria includes the following. One, number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 stood at 60,000. 834, total active cases, 7,575, number of fatalities, 1,116 deaths, number of recovered cases, 52,143, cumulative number of samples tested, 567,857, Number of laboratories established, 69 with at least one in each state. States that have achieved the testing target of 1% of population are FCT has achieved that, and Lagos closely followed by three states that have crossed 50%. 26 states yet to reach 25% of testing target. The testing target is 1% of the population of each of the subnational jurisdictions. Presently, there is a molecular laboratory for COVID-19 testing in every state of the country, and the additional funding provided by the federal government should help to scale up testing for COVID-19. The PTF has concluded arrangements to test additional 100,000 at the various NYSE orientation camps nationwide when they reopen soon. I understand the management of NYSE has already announced a date, the 10th of November, for reopening. And lastly, over 27,000 international passengers have arrived in Nigeria since the resumption of international flights when we opened our international airspaces. It is, however, important to draw the attention of Nigerians to the following significant areas of concern, notwithstanding the seemingly improving numbers. One is the low level of sample collection by states. Two, increasing apathy skepticism and disbelief that still permeates our populace. Three, very low compliance with non-pharmaceutical guidelines by Nigerians. And four, low risk perception leading to low sample collection rate and decreased testing. If we must avoid a second wave and continue to dampen and flatten the curve, it is imperative for us to jointly address these concerns. And the PTF will continue to appeal strongly for collaboration and for all hands to be on deck. Over the last six weeks, the Presidential Task Force carried out activities to boost our case management capacity both in hospitals and at home. This has resulted in increased risk communications and community engagement activities alongside collaboration with most state governments. The reopening of the international airspace has been largely successful 
with most passengers following the letdown regulations and adhering to testing requirements. We have not seen a spike of cases since the reopening of the airspace. The Presidential Task Force, however, noted the huge challenge posed to our national response by states as a result of poor engagement, which manifests strongly in the form of low level of sample collection across the country. As a date, like I said, only the FCT and Lagos have achieved the targets of testing 1% of its population, followed by three states that have crossed 50%. And these states are Plato, Gombe, and River states. 26 other states are yet to measure up to 25% of the population, up to 25% of 1%, because the target is to, 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 to test at least 1% of the population of every subnational jurisdiction. This is considered a serious problem, which is further compounded by the increasing general apathy and disbelief among the risk or about the risk of COVID-19 in Nigeria. After a careful review of the national response, the Presidential Task Force believes that while the recent numbers point to a likely flattening of the curve, consistent with emerging epidemic control, Nigeria is not yet ready for full reopening of the economy. It has accordingly recommended, and Mr. President has approved, the following. One, that Nigeria further relaxes the restrictions in the third phase of the response while maintaining key limitations to curb the risk of a spike in cases. The major changes proposed by the Presidential Task Force are as follows. One, gradual and safe reopening of schools and the NYSC camps. Two, recommencing of sporting leagues, in particular all outdoor activities such as football. Three, sustaining the midnight to 11, I mean to 4 a.m. curfew or movement nationwide. And four, remove, removal of the limitation on civil servants allowed to come back to work. In this particular area, the segment of the civil service that had hitherto not been allowed to come back to work are now, with effect from Monday, allowed to come back to work. Other measures approved by Mr. President include one, maintaining the third phase of the national response to COVID-19 for a period of four weeks with effect from 00.01 a.m. That's one second after 12 midnight on Monday, 19th October 2020. In line with amendments to address economic, social, political, and health considerations reflected in the table above. Sustain engagements to sustain engagement with states and local governments to improve community sensitization and sample collection. Three, continue to monitor the impact of school reopening and the commencement of international travel and enforcing compliance with the protocols set out for safe resumption of these activities. And four, maintaining the already established non-pharmaceutical interventions nationwide in order to flatten the curve. And for the purposes of reminder, the non-pharmaceutical interventions are the wearing of masks properly, not chin masks, but face masks properly, maintaining social distancing, keeping basic hygiene of hand washing or the use of sanitizers, and except necessary, avoid crowded environments. Don't travel except it is utmostly important for you to travel. 
so that you can keep safe. The national coordinator would elaborate on the details of some of these measures, particularly with the category of civil servants that will be allowed to return to work on an alternate basis. Not all of them will come in on the same day who have prescribed so that we can maintain social distancing in their places of work, that the chief executives would introduce processes and take responsibility to ensure that they comply with the non-pharmaceutical interventions and also alternate the days of their reporting in their places of work. Before I close this remark, let me join the whole world to mark the global hand washing day and to emphasize that it is more important than ever before to keep our paws and our hands clean in this fight against COVID-19 pandemic. I now invite the national coordinator to elaborate on the next phase and its guidelines. And I thank you for your kind attention and listening and have a good evening. Uh, to continue using data and science to inform decision making, improving the efficiency of response activities, and emphasizing personal responsibility of individuals in preventing transmission. We know that significant progress has been made in achieving the objectives of slowing transmission, preserving lives, and addressing disrupt disruptions caused by the pandemic. However, the level of compliance with non-pharmaceutical interventions does not support a complete relaxation and easing of restrictions at this time. We have used the following criteria to evaluate the success in this phase of the response. This included sustained reduction of new cases nationwide increased sample collection and testing rates, a reduction of the death rate to less than 1%, a reduction of the test positivity rate to less than 5%, and the placing of measures to manage potential secondary outbreaks. It is therefore the informed recommendation of the PTF that Nigeria maintains phase three of the response with further changes to address economic, sociopolitical, and health concerns. In this regard, an effective from Monday, 19th October 2020, a minute past midnight, the following guidelines will come into place. These recommendations are made in line with our three established thematic areas, movement, industry and labor, and community activities. We have developed guidelines with the NCDC and NYSC in the preparation for the reopening of the orientation camps on the 10th of November, 2020. The PTF has also arranged for additional safeguards to include the testing of all corpus and staff in the camps for COVID-19 prior to commencement of the orientation programs. It is also time for schools to open, but to open safely. And in this regard, we have continued with uh, providing guidelines and engagement with states to ensure close supervision and oversight as schools open. The lifting of restriction on outdoor sporting activities, including football, is in line with earlier consultations with the Federal Ministry of Youth, Sports Development, and the NCDC. However, this is limited to the actual sports itself, not with um, mass gatherings. So in this regard, mass gatherings, including at sports events, is still restricted, as these represent an opportunity for the virus to spread with an increased risk of a second wave. For gatherings in enclosed spaces, this will continue to be limited to only 50 persons with physical distancing and compulsory wearing of face masks, except for workplaces. 
The PTF also believes that it is now time to allow civil servants of all grades to resume work safely. Additional guidance will be provided to heads of MDAs. Chief executives and heads of MDAs are responsible for ensuring the strict enforcement of non-pharmaceutical interventions and making sure that the work environment is safe for their staff. Face masks are expected to be worn in every public building, including government offices. And the PTF expects the chief executives to make sure that this is enforced. We also expect temperature monitoring at points of entry into government offices, as well as the availability of hand washing or hand sanitization facilities in every government building. For civil servants that are resuming from Monday, those below the grade level of 12, the MDAs should make arrangements to ensure physical distancing and avoid overcrowding. The PTF is recommending that they should resume and have alternate day attendance rather than everybody going to the office at the same time. The further relaxation of restrictions at this stage of the response will require additional safeguards and these include the close monitoring of the impact of reopening schools and airports for international travel, supporting states in developing and improving sample collection sites, continued engagement of states that have low sample collection rates, enhanced surveillance across the country, coupled with piloting of new rapid diagnostic test kits, and monitoring the utilization of funds provided to the 32 states for COVID-19 related activities. I will now expand on um, some of the key issues that have to do with the relaxation of uh, this phase of the response. For general movement, the curfew remains from 12 midnight to 4 a.m. There are no formal restrictions of movement outside these hours but the risk still remains, and therefore, vulnerable persons are strongly advised to continue to avoid unnecessary contact, particularly mass gatherings or leaving home, to protect themselves by continuing to remain away from the general public where possible. For air transport, aviation services have now fully resumed. Guideline for international travelers are in place. Only travelers and airport staff to be allowed into airport structures. We continue to work on improving the portal. We will also continue to work with the state governments to ensure more and more private laboratories come on stream so that the cost of testing for travel continues to come down. The generation of QR code, the barcode, following the use of the portal will be made compulsory for admission into the country. But the QR code can be generated without payment, either as a temporary code or after payment, as a permanent code. We expect all passengers from next week to start using the QR code and uploading their COVID-19 PCR results as well as filling the health questionnaires online because we will be moving away from the use of paper at the airports. For land and rail transport, there are no limitations on inter or intrastate travel, but all vendors and service providers must abide by stated stipulations from the Federal Ministry of Transportation and ensure that all NPI measures are applied. I have already spoken about the arrangements in the public sector for the resumption of offices, including uh, MDAs, and all offices are requested to ensure they are ready to receive their staff by this coming Monday. 
For communal commercial spaces, the PTF will continue to push for the institutional ownership of the response. In other words, store owners must take responsibility for compliance with non-pharmaceutical interventions, and facility owners and managers must ensure that physical distancing is observed, as well as the provision of hand sanitizers and hand washing facilities, including the mandatory use of face masks. We will continue to insist on the policy of no mask, no entry, and no mask, no service for communal commercial spaces. For the hospitality and entertainment facilities, hotels to remain open, but observe all non-pharmaceutical interventions. Amusement parks, gyms, and cinemas to continue to operate at half capacity. Event centers with outdoor spaces to remain open. Eateries and restaurants to open only for outdoor seating services. Bars, lounges, and nightclubs to remain closed till further notice. The National Youth Service Corps, we have already put in place uh, arrangements to allow the opening of the camps, and uh, I will be talking about this in greater detail next week, Monday. Um, for schools, uh, we continue to work with the state and local authorities to ensure that guidelines are in place for the safe reopening of educational institutions in line with COVID-19 protocols. We continue to strongly recommend that this opening is done in phases and carried out in stages to ensure that our students are not put at increased risk and neither are their parents, grandparents, or relatives that are vulnerable are placed at greater risk. So educational institutions to continue working with the state governments to ensure the safe opening of these um, schools. There's no change for the religious uh, places of worship. The, in the advice remains the same. And for gatherings, we continue to limit this to 50 persons in enclosed spaces, provided physical distancing rules are followed. But in general, outdoor gatherings are preferred. For, for hospital visits, we advise that visiting sick patients is limited to only immediate family members. The details of the relaxation of the third phase of the response will be published um, in all social media and um, um, normal conventional media uh, for the public. Thank you. What uh, the government is doing to actually sanction those who flout the rules. You mentioned a lot of uh, sanctions and those who should you know, obey these things. How are you, um, what are, the, what are you doing you know, to ensure that this is obeyed to the letter? Thank you. Good evening, members of the PTF. My name is Juliana Taiwo of the Sun Newspapers. I have just one question for the coordinator. I mean, I'm interested in knowing why you, every other sector of the economy has sort of opened up, but bars and nightclubs have remained closed. Why? Do you have anything against them or something? <laughs> you questions, I'll take, I'll, I'll take the, the question on the National Testing Week. We will uh, execute that after the major operations we're planning around the NYSC camps. So we're right now focusing on the significant logistics related to testing everyone coming into every camp uh, at the same time in every state in Nigeria. Huge logistical exercise, both for testing, uh, for pro providing IPC, PPE, commodities, and making sure we are prepared for that. So that's the first operation. Then we will take on the National Testing Week immediately after that. Um, what other question? 
For for the NYC camp, where yeah, the the testing week we haven't really defined the number of uh, people yet. It will depend on the population in each school in each state, and um, that will then define the number of people we test. But the key thing, uh, Mitari asked the question in terms of understanding um, the second wave. Uh, one thing is happening already to understand the burden of infection in Nigeria: the seroprevalence survey. We're doing it in four states already, and we're going to do it in two more states to the end of the year. That will really give us a good idea of the burden of uh, diseases in the country right now. You see, um, even when we carry out the testing week, um, it will not determine the number of new cases. The number of new cases we'll have will be determined by our own behavior, right, and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So right now, we're reopening schools, and schools, by definition, you are going to have more people in confined spaces with um, published guidelines together with the Federal Ministry of Education to mitigate those risks. How effectively they're implemented will then lead to either more transmission or less. Um, you can see some of the demonstrations happening across the country. Um, the virus doesn't know whether you're young, you're old, whether you're a policeman or whether you're a demonstrator. The, it uses the opportunity to jump from person to person. So we continue to advise everyone, wherever you are, to wear masks. You can still have your voice heard if you're wearing a mask. So um, whatever circumstances you are, whether you're managing a school, whether you're managing an NYC camp, or whether you're outside, the important thing is to continue to carry out these uh, public health measures. My final point is, yes, there's a lot of reporting about the second wave in many countries around the world. But a second wave is not inevitable. And it will not happen here just because it's happening in Europe. It will only happen here depending on our own behavior and our own ability to manage this. So as we open up our offices, uh, really the onus is on the, le uh, the leaders uh, of each office, whether you're chief executive of an agency or whether you're the most senior government official in a room in an office space with other people sitting with you, who will determine whether you come into that room with a mask or whether you're allowed to come in without a mask. Who will organize in that setting whether there are sanitizing facilities in that room or not. So a lot of leadership will be required by people as we go into the next phase of um, uh, easing the lockdowns. So thank you very much. Um, Amaka asked about um, pregnant women. So uh, yes, so Pregnant women are allowed to resume um, um, work as well um, in the same way that they would without COVID. Uh, what is important is for them to continue to make sure that they follow those precautions that we have always advised for the general population. In other words, wearing a face mask, hand washing, maintaining distances, etc. And uh, um, a major principle of infection control is to assume that whoever you meet has COVID and act in that way. Because if you do, you will keep yourself safe. Um, so that's something that's really important because we've been asked the question as to whether uh, people should be tested for COVID or civil servants should be tested for COVID, et cetera. But even if we did that, it's only useful for that particular moment in time. Subsequently, people can pick up uh, COVID the next day, two days, three days later. And what's important is our behavior. In terms of the NYC camps, um, yes, so, um, we have come to an agreement with NYC that all those diagnosed uh, as positive for COVID will not be penalized in terms of uh, uh, not attending orientation camps. So, uh, but they will be isolated, they will be treated in the same way as anybody else found positive in the community. So if within the state the policy is for them to be put in an isolation center, they will be moved to an isolation center. They will not be kept within the NYSC comes because it, um, it um, defeats the purpose. So they will be taken out and they will be isolated for the period, yes. And uh, every state does have, uh, virtually every state has an isolation and treatment facility now, uh, thanks to our, the generous donation of uh, CARCOVID. Virtually every state now has some sort of shelter 
where um, uh, persons with um, COVID can be isolated and uh, treated if uh, need be. Um, the other thing has to do with uh, planning for a second wave, yes. So we keep on monitoring. We are looking at the numbers. Uh, what I would caution, though, is um, small changes in the numbers, um, because if the number of samples increases in a day, you will find some changes within, in terms of the positives. So I wouldn't necessarily say that um, the figures over the last two days have dramatically changed um, at all. You would still find the usual slight fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis. What is important is measuring the trend over a period of time. If the trend continues to go up, that's when we, we get worried. There are certain um, decisions we've taken, such as opening the schools, more than, well, it's actually mostly opening the schools and the issue of orientation comes more than international travel that poses a significant risk in terms of a second uh, resurgence. But the PTF will continue to monitor things very closely. Um, we did have a question about, should we go for a second lockdown if we have a surge? All I can say is hopefully we will not have a second lockdown. Uh, but government has its own responsibilities as far as the health of its citizens are concerned. And the PTF will not shy away from taking difficult decisions if there is a need for such decisions. Um, there was a question about what are we doing to ensure sanctions. So we have, we have, we have had sanctions in the past. We've had uh, an event where somebody came to Abuja and um, uh, broke our rules. And we followed that person all the way to Lagos, brought him to Abuja and sanctioned him. Um, but having said that, it's all about personal responsibility. We are all in this together. The police cannot be everywhere. The enforcement authorities cannot be in your house. They cannot be in your schools, etc. So it's all about the general public and ourselves understanding our risks and the need for us to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones from catching COVID. It's all about behavioral change, understanding the risks, and knowing that the risks continue to be there. COVID is still very much around with us. We are pleased that the death rates have really gone down. But nevertheless, people will still die from COVID for weeks to come in the country. I'm definitely sure of it. So we have to protect ourselves by wearing face masks. In a way, you are saying that you care about the per per people that you meet, you care about the people that you live with, and you do not want to bring anything home that would end up harming your family or your loved ones. Bars. Nightclubs, <laughs> I have nothing against them. <laughs> not, not that I drink, but, um, uh, but I, I don't see anything, anything wrong with uh, people going to bars and nightclubs. However, because of the nature of the environment, it's an enclosed space, there are no windows, people are um, standing very close to each other. We are yet to have a mask that would allow you to drink without taking the mask off. So you are at increased risk of transmission. So that's why, and even globally, when numbers start surging, look at the news. The first thing they say is bars will close. So, so that's why we are being very careful. Uh, the national response that we have run in this country has been very calibrated. We have looked at every single risk and then take a decision. Some of the things that we come out here and say, this should not, be, not happen, this should happen, uh, they are not easy decisions. They required a lot of um, negotiation and arguments and looking at the data, etc. before we come out and say bars and nightclubs remain closed. But they do remain closed for very good reasons. Um, and at a point in time when we are very confident that we are at the right time to relax further, we will open up. So for those of you that love nightclubs, uh, please just be a little bit more patient with us. And uh, eventually, hopefully, we'll all get back to normal. I think that's the last question. Thank you. My voice to a couple of issues that have been raised. Mr. Harry, the truth about it, I quite agree with Dr. Sani and Dr. Chukwe that the uh, we will determine whether there will be another lockdown. It's entirely the decision of our people as to how we respond to this. Uh, and uh, rightly, uh, Dr. Sani did say that uh, government has a responsibility, even in these very difficult uh, times, 
uh, to balance life and livelihood, and also to protect the well-being of the citizens of the country. Uh, that's a primary responsibility the government has given to read by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I will not hesitate uh, to come with recommendations for Mr. President's approval as to how to proceed if we perceive any form of danger uh, that is eminently coming to the people of the country as a result of our conduct and non-compliance with the pharmaceutical interventions that have been put in place. And that's why we keep urging the people uh, to take responsibility. Uh, I, I was at an event in the National Assembly today and uh, 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 I was insisting on social distancing. I was also insisting that people should wear their mask properly, not for any other reason, but to make sure that we do not have a cluster of infections in those kind of sensitive areas. When it happened in the White House in the US, in spite of the established institutions and structures that they have had over the last 300 years, for those of you that care to follow the news item, there were interrogations as to whether that infection did not constitute a national security risk. So it's a very, very serious business. And I believe that uh, going forward, we continue to appeal to the people of our country that taking responsibility is a task that each and every one of us must bear. Madam Son, we have nothing against Bia Palos, Mamaput, nightclubs, lounges. But you know the nature of those places. For obvious reasons, they are constructed in such, a in, such, in such a manner for effectiveness of either the lighting or the music. So it's always very compact. We have been there now. You are looking at me as if I'm uh, talking uh, from the... By its nature and by its design, there is a special effect that is supposed to create, either by the vibration of the music or the effectiveness of the lighting. So it's always very compact. And the beauty about it is that you must be dancing and jumping shoulder to shoulder. That's the most dangerous place to be without a face mask. And like Dr. Sani said, we've not gotten to the point where you have created masks with holes and enclosures so that you can drink without taking off your mask, or you can share in entertainment without making noise and enjoying yourself. So what's the point opening a nightclub and people are sitting with masks? What's the, what's the point? It, do, it doesn't make any. It doesn't make any, any, uh, any sense. So we are not averse, and we are not opposed to the leisure and entertainment industry. We want to get out of this new normal as quickly as possible, so that we can return to our ordinary ways of life. The former CDC director in the United States said a thing that stuck with me. He said, vaccines is important, probably the most important and effective thing that we desire to have as quickly as possible. But he gave it a caveat. He said that, look, a vaccine is one thing. There are other complementary measures that if you do not bring them together with vaccine, the effectiveness of vaccine would not even be there. 
And the first thing he mentioned was the wearing of masks, maintaining social distancing, observing the basic ideals of personal hygiene by washing of hands and using sanitizers. For now, that is the only weapon we have. I've said it repeatedly, and I'll continue to say it. From the literature and from all the processes of trials ongoing now, virtually all the processes of trials have been interrupted one way or the other, put, probably put at abeyance or suspended. So the likelihood of vaccine coming on the scene in the next six months is becoming questionable. So do we all have to die before the six months, or do we take steps to ensure that at least we limit or interrupt the processes of the com community transmission stage in which the entire nation has found itself? Let's take responsibility and ensure that we observe the non-pharmaceutical interventions, keep doing it until the vaccines show up. And we will not be quick into taking vaccines. They must be tested, they must be tried, they must be certified. When it comes here, we will put it through our processes of certification and ensure that it is fit for human use. As a country, we've had a, mere, a fair share of vaccines that have been tried. Those of you that are old enough will remember what happened in Kano. A major challenge as a result of the application of vaccine that had negative, major and massive negative effect on the people that took it. Instead of it to deal with the ailment, it created the ailment itself. So we will not be too much in a hurry to take the vaccines that will come out of other jurisdictions without putting them through the processes of certification in our own jurisdiction. But I want to assure you that as a government, we will do everything humanly possible within the meager resources that are available, which I think we have judiciously used to create for facilities. From two testing centers to 69, and they are growing in numbers on a daily basis. From two locations, Lagos and Abuja, we now have testing facilities in all the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory. That's a remarkable achievement. And I will end with the fact that COVID-19, as adverse as its effects are, it has also come with opportunities that we should not miss in reconstructing or recalibrating our health infrastructure, and also in our governance structure to make it inclusive enough that even those that do not have the capacity or wherewithal are not left behind in the journey to the greatness of our nation. Thank you, and have a good evening. Of the Federation, we want the message of today to really sink in. And we want our viewer and listener at home to also take, a, take away an important message from today's briefing. At this point in time, may I please invite the Permanent Secretary, General Services Office, Dr. Morris Berry, to now present the take home message. Mr. Chairman, sir, and the other members of uh, the PTF, gentlemen of the press, good evening. Uh, with uh, the chairman's uh, uh, closing remarks, we have uh, come to the end of today's briefing, and uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening. However, in our usual way, uh, I want to give you one or two uh, take home messages. Um, with these changes read out by the chairman, our responsibility is to allow the 
guidelines read out in this new phase to sink in so that we can make effective use of that and ensure the safety of everyone. So in that case, in the words of the national coordinator, with the resumption of the other categories of civil servants, you consider everybody as potentially positive. So what that means is that you take precautions to ensure that you remain alive. Then the chairman has given us a food for thought in his closing remark. He said, if we must avoid a second wave and continue to flatten the curve, it is imperative for us to have stronger collaboration and for all hands to be on deck. To that extent, he concluded by saying, let's take responsibility. So with that, I want to thank everybody once more for coming today and to plead with you to take responsibility with the enlarged workforce we are likely to have in the coming week. So on that note, I want to thank all of you and to say remain blessed and remain alive until we meet again next week and Monday. God bless you, and God bless all Nigerians. Thank you.